All right, what is going on, everybody? Welcome back to Saber Sims DFS Office Hours. It is Wednesday, July 20th of 2022. We are a day away here from the return of baseball from the All-Star break, which I am uh, eagerly awaiting here. It was only three days off, uh, and it feels like it's been forever since uh, we've uh, gotten the chance to play a real baseball DFS slate. So uh, I'm already pretty excited for tomorrow for baseball to come back. I know... Uh, looks like uh, just a little three-gamer on tap here for tomorrow, but that's okay. Uh, that still gives us a little bit of a sweat. And then the big Friday slate here, 13 games coming up on Friday. So uh, very excited uh, for, for baseball DFS to come back, uh, even though it's just been uh, three days off here. Uh, first of all, if uh, you were watching the show for the first time, uh, my name is Jordan. I'm the head coach here at Saber Sim, And on DFS office hours. Uh, I answer questions from the SaberSim community about how to use SaberSim to build better DFS lineups. So this is uh, an open Q&A show here where the questions I get from everybody in chat drive most of the conversation we talk about here. So if you have questions you'd like me to answer, uh, best place to ask them is in the Office Hours channel in our Slack community, for which there is a link to join in the description of every past Office Hours show. Uh, but you can also ask your questions live in YouTube chat. That's great as well. Uh, or email questions in at support at sabersim.com if you have any questions for me here. We have a few questions in our queue uh, for today already uh, that we'll start diving into here shortly. Um, couple questions about the simulation schedule uh, for baseball, um, about it uh, looks like exposures and, and curating a player pool, uh, tennis question, a couple questions about uh, hitting versus team stack exposure. So we'll just go ahead and uh, kind of start diving in here. Um, again, as always, fire away at me if you have questions you'd like me to answer, uh, and let's get into it. Let's just start with this question here from Tim. Good place to start. And for now, for today, we'll still use Sunday Slate. Um, I think it's a little bit easier to do demos of, of this past uh, eight-game slate as it was with two postponements. Ten-game slate with two postponements, so eight-game slate. Uh, then tomorrow's three-game slate. Um, but we'll use that here. So uh, question, uh, whoops, wait. It's got out of order. Okay, question. Another optimizer question for you for MLB of the game simulated in advance, uh, assuming the starting lineups for games. In other words, if Locke is at 7 p.m. and the Dodgers lineup hasn't come out for a 10 o'clock game and you have to get your lineups in before Locke, is that Dodger game already simulated, assuming they'll use their normal starting lineup? Uh, or does the sim not happen until the lineups are confirmed? Yeah, so we will assume. So I guess for this question, it is actually better uh, if we do tomorrow's slate. So we'll if even if we don't have a starting lineup, we'll just kind of assume a starting lineup for each team. Um, so let's see, I think DraftKings is a little wonky right now, but we should have, uh, some, some FanDuel projections up here. So if we pick the Astros tomorrow, so we've got some lineup, you can basically come in here, um, and actually look and filter by a team. Oops. Wait a minute. I'm getting myself confused here. There we go. Um, Okay. So this is the basically the starting order that the current the current simulation is assuming, right? So you can see Dubon one, Jake Myers two, Kyle Tucker three, Bregman four, and so on. So we're simulating the game assuming this starting lineup. Uh, we've got a couple different data providers that we use for that, the like expected starting lineup, I guess. Uh, but we you just still have projections, you do still have ownership. Uh, again, all the simulations of this game would be assuming that this is the uh the starting lineup here for the the astros so um same thing you know if the dodgers are playing late home game uh 10 o'clock eastern time or something like that and you don't have the starting lineup out out at lock uh we will assume a starting lineup when that final starting lineup comes out we will re-simulate the game uh and re-update uh accordingly so um you can still build lineups in fact i mean obviously you want to build lineups you know you don't want to just eliminate the dodgers necessarily because they don't have a starting lineup route right uh it's a good hitting team you want you want them in your pool so you can keep them in and then uh, update accordingly uh if you're interested in learning the best ways to update for lineups that come out after lock i would go and watch uh our late swap tutorial for baseball um, it's up on our YouTube channel in the baseball section, how to late swap in MLB DFS 12 minute video, uh, walks through how I adjust my lineups after lock for baseball, uh, and use the Saber Sim tools to do so. Um, including things like we got a confirmed starting lineups for the Dodgers an hour after lock, and it's not exactly what we expected. Some guys are not in the lineup. Uh, other guys are, what do we do? Right. So, but 
good first question to get us started. Let me know if you have any follow up after that. That's true for for all sports as well. You know, basketball is a big one, right? Uh, you a lot of times you're getting those starting lineups just a few minutes before the game starts, so you have to assume some kind of starting lineup. Typically, assume that the the normal starting lineup, um, eh, but sometimes that's not what you get when we get that actual final final confirmed starting lineup. So we'll run a re a, a simulation of the a final sim of the game when we have those final starting lineups in there. Um, of course, you can see when those starting lineups and simulations are coming out in the MLB lineup alerts channel in Slack. So that's another really good resource for you um, just to see when that that kind of information is coming out. So cool. And then a uh, good question from Matt here. Let's keep it going. Uh, and he said, hey, Jordan, when using a player pool I put together, would you recommend just checking those players and letting the sim run? Uh, or would you also raise their minimum exposure to ensure being over the field on them based on projected ownership, uh, like 2 to 3x? I've had success both ways, but looking for more consistent success. Thanks. Um, Matt, did you edit this message? I swear I like so every single day I was I always take a look to see what questions are in the queue and kind of get prepared for what I was going to say and I swear this one uh you uh, you you um you switched up on me but that's okay I can answer this one I can I can be quick on my feet here um so yeah so building a player pool for yourself uh would you recommend just checking the players and letting the sims run or would you also raise the minimum exposure um I mean I think in general a good rule of thumb with saber sim is not to add work to your process unless you need to do it, I guess, right? Um, so, I mean, it, it's a little bit of a tricky question here for me because this this often isn't something I do, to just be completely honest, right? I don't really do. I've talked about this a lot. My process for almost any sport rarely includes the curation of a player pool. A lot of times I let the players I end up having in my lineups, um, I, I leave my player pool wide open when I'm building my lineups and I kind of do a lot of that post build and maybe eliminate players from there. But a lot of times... Uh, I'm not I'm not like going through and, and picking what players are actually going to make it into my lineups above and beyond like, you know, some very minor things like eliminating players below a certain projection or, you know, uh, I, the only other thing that comes to mind is occasionally on golf eliminating players below a certain percent chance to make the cut. Um, that's it. But assuming you are curating a player pool, I know like a really good example of that would be pitchers where maybe you are, you know, maybe you're going through and you have an eight game slate like this and you're picking the names that you, you want to use at your pitcher spots. Right. Uh, and anybody that isn't in, you know, I don't know. Um, uh, let's see. Let's see. Um, Oh, did I remove everybody from the pool here? I did. Let's add, let's add the, the batters back and just do pitchers here. So maybe you're going through, right? And maybe you're playing, I don't know. Maybe this is your pitching pool, right? Um, to answer the question, I, uh, I I don't think I would go through and set minimum exposures for every player in the pool like that before running a lineup just to see what I get, right? Um, and so you could come in here and maybe you're building 20 lineups and you can come see what you get. And maybe you have kind of some expectation that, you know, maybe you don't want even exposure to all of these different pitchers, but you want some exposure to all of these different pitchers, right? Well, I would run the build, see how this shakes out by default, see what you get, uh, and then see what you can get done on the, see what you can get done in the post build process by adjusting minimum exposures and see if you can get lineups you like. And if you're finding that you're not able to get the exposures that you want to these different players, then maybe you come back to the projections tab and set some minimum exposures to kind of flatten things out and keep things a little bit even. Um, but I don't think I would make that a part of my day-to-day -day process on, on, in general, just because I think it would probably take a lot of time to do that. And I think most of the time you probably wouldn't necessarily need to do that. Right. Um, with that said, you know, specifically here, since you mentioned, um, you know, uh, would you raise their minimum exposure to ensure being over the field based on projected ownership, like two to three X, um, y y keep in mind that you're not always going to be able to do that, right? Like you, if you curated a player pool and said, I'm only going to play these players and I want to be a minimum two X over the field on all of them, you, you might, you just might not be able to do that. Like mathematically speaking. Um, so some of that is going to be a little bit slate dependent of like, who's in your actual player pool, how many players are in your player pool, right? Like we probably couldn't do that here. We could, we definitely couldn't do that with pitchers, right? We couldn't get two to three X over the field on all of the pitchers in our pool, right? Um, so, you know, here's, here's what I would do, right? So our, our, we had our five guys in our pool, right? And we're getting exposure to three of them. So we're missing a little bit of Spencer Schreider uh, and Dylan C. So maybe you want to get a little exposure to those guys here, then maybe you could set that min exposure, right? 
Uh, and maybe, maybe here you're going two to three X over the field. Right. And then let's see, can we, you know, we might be able to do something like this. And this is, I think just quicker than trying to do it for every single player. Right. So we're a little over the field on Cole, who's, you know, projected massively owned. We're over the field on Nola, also projected very high owned. And then we get, you know, two X the field on the other three guys that are in our pool as well. And I just think this is a little bit of an easier approach as opposed to trying to do this for every player in your pool, for every slate, for all these different situations. So um, let me know if that answers your your question there. Um, again, just kind of reviewing here. So when using a player pool, would you recommend just checking the players and letting the Sims run? That's what I would do first. I would see what you can do, see what you, see what you get doing that. Uh, making any adjustments here on the post-build phase. Maybe you get lineups that you like. And if you're not happy, um, then I'd come back and, and maybe make some adjustments. But in fact, you know, honestly, for me, the first thing I would do before I started even setting minimum exposures, like I would, I would probably take a look at the projections, right? Like let's say we tried to do what we just did and we found that we couldn't get the lineups we liked at all. Right. They weren't it wasn't working. We couldn't get any we couldn't get over the field on Strider or Cease in our pool of 500. You know, you might have actually a little bit better success adjusting the projections until their their point per dollar value is a little bit more in line with the other guys in the similar range. Right. And then running another build. And, and from here, maybe you could even set at this point, maybe you could, just to make sure you don't have to do it a third time. Um, you know, maybe you maybe you also do something like that. But I would only do this after you you try the first time and find that it doesn't work. So let me know if that helps. If you have any follow-up questions there, or if I um, if I misunderstood, let me know. Um, particularly, uh, be, particularly the reason I'm saying that here is because I, I, I definitely remember you having a different question originally, and I felt like, I can't remember what it was, but I felt like the flavor of that original question was different. Um, so that makes me think that I might, I might, I might have slightly misunderstood, but um, anyway. Um, let's jump ahead to the next question uh, from David here about tennis. Um, and he says, hey, Jordan, uh, dip my toes into the tennis slate today. Could you please go over again your thoughts on using the win percent stat for underdogs? In my initial build, I had a player whose exposure was more than double their expected win percent. That seemed too much. So I capped their exposure at expected win percent. I was playing 61 lineups over uh, 320 max contests and one single entry. Yeah, sure. So uh, this is something, you know, for those that maybe haven't heard this before, this is something that I, I mentioned in the How to Beat Tennis DFS video, um, kind of a heuristic or a rule of thumb of a way to manage your exposures uh, and limit limit some risk, especially uh, for underdogs. I think this strategy works. I actually think this strategy works pretty good in tennis. I also think it's a decent idea in uh, MMA, any sport where there's kind of a clear win percent for each each player. So uh, let's, let's just copy exactly what uh, David was doing here. So I'm going to assume you were using the default projections here in this case. Uh, and you said you had 61 lineups. Um, so we'll, we'll just assume something like this and see what we get out of this. Um, let's see what we get here, but, um, and this is, a this is mostly a risk tolerance thing. This isn't, I wouldn't say this is so much strategic or like exploitative uh, for, for for like leverage. This is mostly just a a way of kind of thinking about you know how much how much risk am I comfortable taking on in my lineup. So uh, what I like to do here um, is I add the win percent here, right? So you know this is a cool feature. This this was added somewhat quietly over the last year, but you can now add any of the expo any of the columns that you see on the projections tab to a build screen. So really useful for research. But uh, I like to add the win percentage here and then click apply, and then I will drag it over and put it next to my exposure, right? And this is actually literally the 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 probability, right? The the listed in a decimal format of somebody winning, right? And what I typically like to do here, there's a couple different ways you could do this, but um, I like to look, I, I would say in particular at the underdogs. So let's look at like lowest win, win percentage to highest. And I'm looking, generally speaking, for like significant outliers here uh, from the player's raw win probability in the, in the actual match to my exposure. Not to say that there's anything wrong with being over the field, like not even over the field, over a player's win probability, right? We could take, um, you know, I don't know, um, Rebecca Peterson here, and, you know, we could have 60% exposure, right? That's that's not inherently wrong, um, but we're, we're taking of our, we're taking 60% of our portfolio, right? And investing into a, 
we're investing into a player who has at best a 28% chance of paying off, right? And this isn't even an optimal rate. This is just a win percent, right? So like we're saying like for, for Rebecca Peterson here to even have a chance of showing up in the optimal, she has to win her match, which happens 28% of the time. Well, if we have 60% exposure, right, that might be too much. So typically, like my my rule of thumb here um, is that I will use win percent as kind of a guidepost and look for what I what I feel like are significant outliers, right, um, where my exposure is far outweighing the raw win probability. And it actually, you know, I would say in general, it doesn't happen that often. Where you're going to see it happen a lot more is if you really start to crank ownership fade, right? Just for the the you know. Just for the, the hell of it here, I'm going to run another build with a really high ownership fade, right? And in this case, you're going to see lineups with much lower ownership, generally more underdogs start to get promoted more, right? And this can be kind of a tool of, well, not a tool. This can this could be an example here of like having a, a lineup portfolio that is a lot more aggressive with, with lower owned plays. So let's do this here now and add this back in. Okay. So now let's go back, right? Um, okay, and now we're starting to see a little bit more, right? So like Ud Udvardi here, right? 31% chance to win the match, almost 50% ownership, right? 50% exposure, right? Um, are there any others that really jump out here? That that looks to be the big one. So even still, like really not that bad, right? 31% chance to win the match. That's, I mean, what, like one in three, 40, 47% exposure, right? That, that doesn't seem out of control to me. Um, I, I would say, you know, it, it, it's especially at like where I'm mostly concerned with this, especially would be some of the really lower underdogs, right? And this can happen. My process in MMA can sometimes uh, lead like, so a lot of times for my MMA process, right? There's, there's fewer players on a slate, um, fewer fights on a slate. So my MMA process, a lot of times I'll run my initial research build and I'll do my first, um, like, first draft, I guess, of adjusting player projections based on ownership. If I think, Somebody's going to be really over-owned, I'll turn their own, their projection down. If I think they're going to be under-owned, I'll turn their projection up a little bit. And sometimes I end up in a situation where I have like somebody who has a 50, I have like a 15% chance to win the fight underdog that I have in like 90% of my lineups, right? 100% of my lineups. And I think that's a good opportunity to kind of check that against that probability here. So um, I, I, I think, again, I, I don't I don't even think there's really like a clear like you know, rule of thumb or always do this. That's not the vibe I'm trying to give off. But I think just in general, having this number in your mind and understanding what this number represents can be a decent way to give yourself, um, to make yourself more opinionated on how much exposure you want to a particular player, right? A lot of times I get a lot of questions from people that are like, hey, I know you always talk about adjusting exposures to manage your risk, but I don't have a sense of intuition about how to do that, right? I don't I don't look at an exposure number and say, oh, well, I know how much how much exposure I am comfortable having to this player. Well, I think using something like the win probability of a player is a way to become opinionated about that, right? Um, and that's still going to differ for everybody. But, you know, is 47.5% chance to Udvardi or 47.5% exposure to Udvardi here uh, too much? Well, this person has a 31% chance to win the tennis match, right? Now, you tell me what your level of comfort is there. Maybe, you know, for some people, being overexposed compared to even just the win probability might be too much. Uh, for others, maybe you're comfortable, you know, having double the exposure to the win probability here for, for that particular player. So um, I also, part of the reason I think this is really useful in tennis uh, is I, a lot of times I do this with ownership, right? And I'll say something like, you know, um, maybe, let's see, I don't know. Um, maybe we have some, you know, really heavily owned player here and I want max, I don't know, maybe I want to be max equal to the field on, on Rublev here, right? And that's fine. The one thing with tennis in particular is that the ownership projections, it's a harder sport to project ownership for just because there's less information out there uh, I think the field is probably worse at tennis DFS. They're not even, they're not necessarily even going to find the best plays as reliably. Um, and I, I think the win, the win probability is a little bit more of a solid, reliable number in the way that ownership projections might not necessarily be as much just yet. Um, so I, I like to use it as kind of another option there, but let me know if that helps. 
um, you know, happy to, to cover, uh, cover this in a little bit more detail if there's follow-up questions there. Um, but, um, so the other thing, and the last thing I'll note on this, uh, is like, you know, one thing that I'm particularly looking at here is there's always a lot of dogs on a slate, right? Like there are, I mean, there half, half the field, right? Roughly is, is going to be an underdog on the slate. Um, and when there's a situation where we are, where you're like really highly exposed to one, right. Versus all the others, it, that has never really made a ton of sense to me, unless there's like, unless there's an ownership reason or a pricing reason, right? Like, I mean, I guess in this particular case, there is a little bit of a pricing reason, but it doesn't, it would not make sense to me to be massively exposed to one underdog when there are a ton of other players that probably have a roughly similar chance to, to win, right? Like, there is a pricing discrepancy here, but there's a bunch of other, you know, there's other similar players with similar odds and I'd rather kind of like spread out exposure. So that's why I really am looking for, for outliers when I do this. That's, and that's why I'm also particularly looking for underdogs, right? I just want to avoid a situation where I'm like taking a huge stand on one random player or in the case of MMA fighter who has a 35% chance to win when there's six other players on the slate that are also all between 30 and 40% chance to win. So anyway, um, that's kind of how I, how I think about that. But, um, and then we have uh, a handful of different questions from Kino here. So um, let's kind of dive into these here. Um, so this says, you often say that you prefer to adjust individual hitter exposures rather than team stack exposure. Some relevant questions. Okay, so first one. Question A, uh, do you do this even for big slates? It can be quite time consuming. Uh, yes, um, but I also am not, I'm not necessarily, so I'm not necessarily adjusting every single individual player, right? That's kind of not really necessarily the point of what I'm doing here. So let's build, you know, just for the heck of it here, let's build a big pool of lineups. Um, let's build 1500 for this slate, this path. Oh, wait. Let's put everybody back in the pool first. So, okay, let's build this. Um, so I, I, while this is building, I'll, I'll address this question at least a little bit more generally first. Um, this, I've noticed this kind of seems to be something that I've seen people get a little bit hung up on, uh, me saying that I like to adjust individual batter exposures as opposed to team stack exposures. This is really, really, really a matter of personal preference. Like this is not, there's a right way and a wrong way. Um, I prefer to edit individual hitter exposures mostly because I feel like it's just a little bit more granular. And at the end of the day, I've always felt that ultimately we, we enter lineups made from players and stacks are a way to describe that particular lineup but you don't, you don't play a Dodgers stack, right? You pick five individual Dodgers players. So when I'm editing exposures, you know, as, as a way to manage my risk, I just like having that one extra degree of granularity there, which I get by editing batting exposures. Now that is not, that's by no means, that's just kind of how I think about it. That is by no means saying that that is the right way to do it, or that is what everybody should be doing. Uh, so, I mean, if you feel like it's way easier or way more simple or just the way your brain works to edit, edit and manage your risk looking at stack exposure, then, then so be it, right? Um, here, I'm going to cut this off. We don't need a full 1500. Um, and, and with that said, right, a lot of times what I'm actually doing here is not making individual strategic decisions on every player in the slate, right? That would be time consuming 121 hitters in the pool that I'm, I'm figuring out the exact exposure I want to each of them. Typically what I'm doing here is like generally kind of figuring out, you know, what's my level of comfort, how, how exposed, how comfortable am I being exposed to any one hitter in the pool and then capping off the, a couple of guys at the top. Right. Um, or, you know, so I might do something like, you know, on a t eight game baseball slate, maybe I want like max, you know, maybe I want max 30% any one hitter, right? So I'm coming in here and just basically, you know, 
doing a little bit of trimming off the top here to make sure that I max 30% one player. Uh, you know, one other exception to that would be, I've talked about, you know, sometimes I run a research build. Um, and especially when I, uh, when I need to do my process a little bit quicker for that particular slate, one thing I might do is maybe find two to five or six players that I think there's a particular angle on, on that particular slate. Um, so, you know, one thing I did think was pretty interesting on this slate, um, the one that was, was last Sunday, uh, is that we had the perception of that there were two elite aces that were far and away the best overall pitching plays on the slate. Um, and I felt like Strider and Cease, based on kind of my research builds, were a little bit underappreciated. So I might come in here and also maybe, you know, if I was actually doing this, maybe I'm coming in here and, you know, doing this um, and getting some exposure there. Um, I know those are pitchers, so um, maybe not as good of an example, but we could do this for hitters too, right? Let me remind myself looking at this here. Um, you know, actually, you know, I, th this is a good example. If I had, so if I had identified that I wanted to just be over the field on a stack, right. It, it is probably just easiest for me to handle that here, right. Maybe I like Texas, um, right. Maybe I knew I wanted 25% Texas stacks, right. Well, that that's certainly easier to accomplish just by doing this in the stacking page, as opposed to trying to find individual Texas bats here uh, that I'm going to bump up. So maybe that's a better way of saying it. When I'm, when I'm thinking about my hitting exposure from the standpoint of managing risk, I will just adjust individual hitting exposures because I have something specific I'm trying to accomplish with those exposures, right? I, I'm trying to make sure, for example, I don't have more than 30% of any one hitter or something like that, right? But if you have something that you are trying to do with a stack, use the stacking exposures, right? Um, so let's keep it going here. Uh, question B, I think it can quite, be quite effective for fading a player. And I saw you doing this often, but do you also bump up some players based on the research build? So again, I mean, it, it's like, it's kind of hard. Okay, so I, I, uh, this is a tricky question. I, I will say a couple things. So first of all, if you do identify a team that you think has upside and being is being identified as being underappreciated on by the field in your research build, I would probably be more likely to do it the way I just demonstrated, like bumping up Texas to get 25% exposure or something like that. It is rare for me that I identify a particular player. Like it's not, it's, it would be, it would be a little bit weird for me to like, look at a guy like Corey Seager or something like that and be like, Oh, the field is underappreciating specifically Corey Seager's probability of ending up in the winning lineup. And even if the research build said that to me, Without also saying that about other Texas bats, I would probably just assume that that was somewhat noise in general. For hitters, most of the time when I run my research build, I am less focused on, I'm more focused on players and teams that I'm going to fade than players or teams that I'm going to play, right? Just because it's kind of, you know, if we just, let's actually just run a research build, right? Because I think this will help kind of show this. But it's kind of a it's kind of a math thing, right? So on this slate, we have eight games, sixteen teams playing baseball, right? And if I remember correctly, when I ran some of my research builds for this slate on Sunday, a lot of what I saw was that the Braves were likely to be a little bit overowned, right? They were the best projected team. They were the best projected in like hitting environment. Um, but they were also the chalkiest team. And it was an eight eight game slate, right? A lot of different directions to go. When you fade the Braves as a result of that, you are basically, you, you are, uh, the probability is in your favor, right? Because the Braves might have a 10 or a 15% chance of being the optimal stack. So by fading them, you're opting into uh, all, any other team being the best stack, right? But when you pick a team and you say, okay, Texas is underappreciated, right? I'm going to get exposure to that team. You are you are targeting lineups at a very specific outcome, right? So a general trend for me, right, is that I, I more often than not am finding players and teams to fade from my research build than players and teams to target and to play, right? Um I mean, that's also just true. And, and like, you can even see that just looking at leverage, right? Typically, you are going to see bigger negative leverages than positive leverages, right? The, the 
the most inefficient ownership in DFS in, in general is more often than not too much ownership on the best projected plays as opposed to too little ownership on other plays on the slate. So most of the time when I actually run the research build, what I get out of that is not, oh, I'm going to play this guy. I can't wait to play this guy. It's more I'm going to actually fade or be half the field or be approached with caution for that particular player. Um, so, and then again, like with that said, right, if I was, if I, even if I was actually looking at players that I thought were underappreciated, right, like, I, I don't know if I would look at this, for example, and say, I really want to now go bump up my exposure to Wilson Contreras, right? Uh, partially, or, or I guess like a large part, because these, when these numbers are get really small, right? And, and these are pretty small, they become pretty noisy, right? Like, yes, I guess if if Wilson Contreras' ownership is exactly 3.42 and his, his optimal rate is exactly 8%, then maybe there's a little bit of inefficiency there by the field. But what if this real number is 6% and what if this real number is 7%, right? Which is probably totally within the, the error of those calculations. And then you got 25% exposure to a Wilson Contreras one-off for, for nothing, essentially, Right. So I'm looking for I, I typically try to look for reasons to believe that the numbers are are reliable or trustable. So one of one of those really good examples would be if you kind of see a stack here, which in this case you can see a Yankee stack, right? Yankees, 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 right? If the entire stack is underowned, it makes me feel a little bit more comfortable that the that this is actually accurate. So maybe the Yankee stack would have been a team that I got to, right, based on this. Right? It looks like they are actually a little bit underappreciated as a stack. Another example would be when the numbers are a little bit like higher in general, right? I feel a little bit more comfortable saying that, yeah, you know, Cole and Nola are probably a little bit overowned relative to their expectation, just because Garrett Cole's ownership would have to come all the way down to 40% or so. And actually, I think it did uh, when this slate actually played out. I think he was about 40% owned, but Garrett Cole's ownership would have to come all the way down to about 40% for him to even be efficiently owned. Right. So there's a lot more. Right. Do you see what I'm saying here? In this case, let's go back to here. Right. Contreras, Contreras's ownership only has to come up to 8% for efficient ownership in theory. Right. It only has to move four percentage points. Garrett Cole has to move what? Right. Garrett Cole has to move 25 percentage points of ownership to be efficiently owned. Right. So anyway, let me get, let me get kind of back on track here. Cause I'm, I'm, I can tell I'm going on a research build uh, rabbit hole here. So do I bump up some hitters based on the research build? I would say very rarely. If I, if there's actually, I would say if there's actually a team that I think is going to be inefficiently owned, like, like in this case, I'm seeing with the Yankees, I would probably just do that from a stack. Right. Um, now I, it, I wouldn't necessarily, again, it's personal preference. I wouldn't like talk you down if you went over here and instead handled it this way and said like, Hey, look, I want, I want 15% Aaron judge, right? That's going to get you to Yankee stacks anyway, right? It's all going to, it's all going to have the same effect at the end of the day, because the lineups are already built. They're already correlated, right? If we have 2.7% Yankee stacks and we come up here and we bump Aaron judge's projection up to 15%, right? Or 15% exposure, Right. Now look how many Yankee stacks we have. So it's it's does basically, oh, I realize you guys can't totally see this, right? So we went from 2% Yankee stacks to 11% Yankee stacks, right? We could even come over here and say, no, we want actually more. We want 20% Yankee stacks, right? And get a little bit more exposure, right? And then we can come back and now see what our judge exposure jumped to. Now it's, it's still 15%, right? So a lot of different ways to do it. Kind of depends on what you are trying to get out of it, um, but... And then C, sometimes Sabre has very low percent of one through four hitters while being six X the field through the six through nine hitters. I guess this has to do with salary cap, but still looks extreme to me. Uh, do you manually adjust this sometimes? I typically don't. Um, I do understand the argument of doing that. Um, I actually think it's less about salary and more about ownership. Um, the field just really inefficiently rosters lower owned hitters in the order. In fact, that's that's one of the more popular things that I do get out of my research build is like, well, oh, the Braves are too chalky, but actually a really convenient way to stack them is to stack them six through nine or something like that, um, especially on good teams, right? Good teams typically have good hitters hitting lower in the order. Um, and I think 
people shy away from them too much. But you could come in here, you know, maybe you maybe you're looking at the Yankees. Um and uh I think it's perfectly fine to come in here and say, like, hey, I want to make sure I'm getting I, I bumped up the exposure to Yankee stacks. I think Yankees are an underappreciated team, and I want to make sure I'm getting to the to the top of the order accordingly, right? And making sure, or maybe maybe not overly playing the bottom of the order, right? Um, maybe you look at this and you think, I mean, Tim Lacra <laughs> in this case, uh, Tim LaCastro hit like a home run and and a triple and a double or something like that. Like he he went crazy, but maybe you looked at this and said, hey, I you know. I wanted to get to 20% Yankee stacks, but I didn't want 15% LaCastro. And you could come in here uh, and do something like that. Um, obviously, we have hindsight here. Um, so you could do something like that. Um, but anyway, so, um, but I, but for me personally, it's not something that I look at too much. Most of the, in general, I think that the field way overthinks batting order position. Um, so I actually like to play some of those lower owned hitters. Um, and then, uh, okay, D. Um, uh, okay, after adjusting individual player adjustments, do you still go to team exposure and adjust it further? If so, aren't you concerned about the conflict or too much restraint? Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. There's. There's typically not. So we kind of covered this a second ago, but there's typically not a lot of conflict there, right? They. They work. They work together, right? Like. Again, when we when we bump up judges' exposure to fifteen percent, it naturally gets us to more Yankees bats because the lineups that have Aaron Judge in them in our pool are more likely to feature Yankee stacks. So they they kind of work together. Now you might you know again we we bumped up Judge to fifteen percent and that got us to eleven percent Yankee stacks. But maybe you had twenty percent in your mind that entire time. You could come in here and add. A little bit more there as well. I wouldn't worry. I wouldn't worry so much about double counting, right? I mean, again, the main thing that's really nice about SaberSim here is that the lineups in the, when you're editing here in the post build phase, these lineups are already built and they're already good, right? They're already correlated, so you don't have to worry about like, oh well, like, am I going to bump up Aaron Judge to fifteen percent and end up with suddenly fifteen percent Aaron Judge one offs? No, you're you're probably going to mostly get more Yankee stacks out of that, and you might get the occasional Aaron Judge one off as well. Uh, but because the lineups, because any given lineup made with Saberson that features Aaron Judge in it, is more li more likely than not to include other Yankees bats, it's also likely that you get Yankee stacks in there. So if I could sum up like this kind of entire suite of questions here, I would I would do it as do what makes sense to you, right? I really, there is, there is not a lot that like, just being totally honest, there is not a lot that you can really like mess up here in the post build process because the lineups have already been made and there, and you know that they're already good and optimized for the contest you're playing. So if not even looking at a batter exposure and just focusing entirely on your stack exposure is what makes sense to you, then great. If you don't want to look at stacks at all, and just look at hitting exposures and adjust from there, that's great. If you want to use some combination of both, that's also fine. Um, but I, 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 again, like I kind of have a way that that kind of just works for me based on what I've, I've done, but it's not necessarily the right way. So, um, so anyway, um, let me know if that helps. If there's follow up on any of that, happy to, to go a little bit further into that. Um, but yeah. Okay, cool. Let's jump over to YouTube chat here. Um, get caught up. I saw some questions coming in here. Um, looks like, uh, Ryan's been, uh, hammering WNBA bets, uh, but excited for baseball as well. Um, Neil said, uh, are we doing the NFL mini max challenge again this year? Um, that's a good question. So, uh, I think we want to do something like that again, but I think it will probably I think it will probably be a little bit different this year. Um, we'll have to see. Like, so part of the reason we picked that contest last year, there were a few reasons is, is like, we were trying to push, we were trying to create a contest that incentivized playing the contests that we thought people should play. So the mini max was really two things. One, it's so big for NFL that it had a really high number of effective entrants, right? Uh, and it also allowed you to cheaply get a lot of unique lineups in play. And that's something that we think is important in DFS is diversifying and playing 
playing as many unique lineups as possible, really. Um, and I think especially in football, um, where there is a little bit more of a, a recreational audience, uh, you know, it's it's very easy for people to say, oh, I've got like, I'm going to play 50 bucks. And like they go and create like three lineups or something like that. Right. And we were trying to push people away from that. Well, since our DFS profit plan video and research, the way that we kind of recommend people enter contests has changed. So I think we would like to do another promotional contest kind of thing, but we'll probably want to, we might want to maybe relook at it so that it incentivizes people to play the contests and the contest portfolios that we recommend for football, just like we now do for, for other sports. So um, I think uh, probably like a, uh, optimistic, yes, we're still planning on doing something like that, but it'll probably look a little bit different than it did last year. So, um, but we'll see. And more information about that to come here. Um, so, um, okay. Patrick, I see some of these questions about the uh, computer. If we have time towards the end, uh, we can chat about that a little bit, but I want to hit some of these DFS questions first. Uh, Michael said, how can I use Saberson when building PGA lineups to get a smaller player pool than the builder is giving me? Um, that is the builders getting a pool of 37 when I want 25 so that the players gain more exposure. Uh, I mean, a couple of different ways to do it kind of depends on like what, what you're starting with here. Uh, if you have 25 guys that you just know that you want to play, I would say the best, best advice I could give would be to just remove everybody from your pool uh, and then add in the 25 names that you actually want to see in your lineups, right? That way we won't use any other players in your lineup pool. You'll just get those guys. Uh, if you mean a little bit more like you don't have 25 names, you just want a maximum of 25 players. Um, probably instead what I would do is build your lineups and then limit and then reduce your pool until you have 25 left. Lowest exposure to highest, I think, would probably be the way that I would do this. Um, so um, I'll show you what I mean. The one thing, I mean, one thing to keep in mind here is that, you know, I think two things. One, golf is a high variance sport, very high variance sport. Uh, and you should be aware that, you know, if you're building, like, if you're building 20 lineups for a 10 to 50K uh, size contest, right, and using the default sliders, the, the sim precision that is set to the default value here of nine is using three tournament simulations per lineup, right? And that is naturally getting you to a pool of 44 golfers, right? That's not to say that this is the right way to play golf DFS for this particular contest, but you should be aware if you are condensing from 44 to 25, you are going to have higher, you are going to have uh, bigger swings to your bankroll and uh, uh, higher like variance to your results here. You are you are uh, taking on more risk in this portfolio than than what you would have by default. But assuming that is what you want to do, right? I just think you should be aware of that. Uh, what I would probably do here uh, is just start unchecking names until you got down to the size player pool that you want, right? Um, and it's going to resist that at first, again, because as you condense a player pool down or as you remove players from the pool, like there are a lot of different golfers that have a shot at being in the optimal lineup on a given slate. So, but at, at a certain point, as you start to remove guys, um, the pool will begin to condense. So you can see here now, we will slowly approach the size of the player pool you want. And this is how I would do it if you knew that you wanted max 25, but you were unopinionated about what those 25 names were. If you know what 25 names you want to begin with, or even if you know, even if you know the max 40 guys that you want, and then you ultimately want to narrow down to 25 from there, I would do more of this in, in the projections tab so that you get a better pool of lineups. Um, but we are approaching... 25 here and we can kind of see i'm I'm also just kind of curious how this ends up looking when we're done so um but i think golf in particular i hear this a lot i think there is like a rhetoric in golf dfs that you should be playing a really tight pool and okay so 
OK, so this was actually a good case study. So in this particular case, we weren't able to do this. We get this message, we need to expand the lineup pool in order to match your exposures. If this happens, what I would actually probably do uh, is I would probably come in here and turn your sim precision down. Right. Basically, what that message is saying is you're getting too diverse. Your 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 pool of 500 lineups is too diversified that you can't even limit your player pool down to 25. Uh, in that case, I think you'd be best off lowering sim precision. Right. Um, maybe starting by cutting it in half or cutting it to like five, like I did, and then trying this again. Um, we'll actually probably just get a much more diversified pool of lineups here anyway, or sorry, much less diversified pool of lineups here from from the start. Yeah, so in this case, so we're starting from 34 instead of um, instead of uh, 44 or 45 or whatever it was. But I actually think the more I think about this too, I think if you want to if you want to cut down to a certain size player pool, I actually because you are going to be assuming more risk by doing that, I would spend the time to figure out what 25 golfers those actually are, right? Rather than just letting, rather than kind of backing up into it, that's what I I would actually do that. Um, like the reason being, you're, you're choosing, you're playing a, a higher risk, higher reward style anyway. You might as well be opinionated about what golfers you're investing into at that point. Um, so, but. Um, okay, Jen says, pretty random, but is MLB DFS on the softer side compared to NFL or NBA? Uh, Shady is right. NFL, NFL is definitely the softest in terms of the, the average skill level of the average player, right? The theoretical ROI that you would have in any given contest in NFL is, is, is much softer. It, the contests, if you are playing like the larger field stuff, uh, are also much larger, right? Like by an order of magnitude sometimes, which is increases the, the variance, uh, quite a bit. Um, one of the things we want to do with our contest selection simulations here uh, is spend a little bit more time doing some NFL specific research, just because I think there is an interesting push and pull there of, yes, the contests are massive, mostly filled up by a bunch of soft, casual, recreational players, but those are still lineups that ha that need to be beat, right? Like your raw probability of winning or, or finishing um, in, in certain positions is lower than it might be because you're talking about a contest that, that can be a full order of magnitude larger in sometimes. Um, so, but NFL is definitely like the theoretical softest sport. Um, in terms of is baseball DFS softer compared to NF NBA? I think it's a tough question. I mean, NBA contests are bigger as well, right? I think there's a, I think there is a little bit more casual interest in NBA. Uh, I don't know, apart from that, which one is a softer sport. I think they have different edges, right? Um, I think two things in baseball. One, the, on average, right, the average person in a baseball contest probably still doesn't correlate their lineups as much as they should, right? I think that's come a long way in the past few years. They, even if we were even talking two or three years ago, right? I mean, it would, it would just it was still almost enough to just stack and insta profit in baseball. Um, I think the field is getting a little bit better with stacking on average, but I would say on average that the, the, the average player in baseball DFS probably still doesn't stack enough. Um, I think one of the biggest edges in baseball, and you could you could call it, you could describe it a few different ways, but I think there's a uh, a significant issue by the average player playing understanding like ranges of outcomes of players um it, it ultimately culminating in inefficient ownership um i think is a massive a massive edge in baseball um the field assumes that well projected well pro hitters that are well projected on average should be rostered at way higher at a way higher rate than they actually should be um, and that happens with pitchers too, but especially with hitters. So you have this big ownership and efficiency issue there. Uh, in basketball, I think the biggest edge is by far related to late swap. Um, even just late swapping period, right? Like that I think the average NBA DFS player may not know late swap exists or just doesn't want to do it. And then I think there's this other subset of players that has some idea that it's there, but doesn't really do it the right way. Uh, and I think I think the late swap edges is massive uh, in basketball. And I think it's actually even a little bit unexplored. Like we're still at the point with basketball late swap where the most of the field just isn't really doing it or doing it the right way. There is a bigger frontier of late swap, even if the field, even if a hundred percent of the field late swapped, right? I think there's, there would probably be an issue or an exploitable edge of people um, 
not appropriate people late swapping to put like players that are playing basketball that night into their lineups, but not actually looking at current av- actual scoring performance or, or uh, revealed ownership numbers. So I think NBA DFS um, still has a pretty healthy edge frontier, I guess, um, because I, I, uh, I can see, I can see more, I can see a, a future edges in, in NBA DFS, even assuming that the field got a lot sharper than they are right now. Um, so I don't, I don't know between baseball or NBA, which one is like, which one has a bigger edge. Um, personally, I'm not sure where I, where I lie there. Um, but I think they are both definitely beatable DFS sports. So, um, but Patrick says, what's more important projections or ownership? Uh, I was building lineups for all-star game and all I used were projections. Uh, this is kind of an interesting DFS thought experiment here. I would probably say projections are more important ultimately, right? Like you need, you need some baseline level of understanding in a vacuum, right? Even if, if you were playing, if you were not even playing against other players, right? And just trying to predict performance, you need some way of doing that, right? Like you can only, I think even like ownership really even only makes sense when compared to some baseline of probability of success of a player. So I, I think you need, I think ultimately you need projections first and like for the all-star game or for brand new sports, right? Like formula one is a good example, right? Brand new DFS sport from this year. You, you typically like, you typically need projections before you need ownership to be successful playing the sport because you need a sense of, of, of projecting outcomes of like figuring out what could happen in the actual sporting event first, before you figure out what's going to happen in the DFS event. Um, I also like, I mean, in, in, or in the infancy of newer sports and of DFS as a whole, right? Like a sport has to mature to a certain point before ownership even really becomes valuable, right? Mostly because you need to be able to, to project ownership. You need to be over the, the field needs to be somewhat, uh, like reliable, or predictable themselves, which kind of almost requires that decent projections exist, right? So there's, there's almost kind of like a, a owner, accurate ownership projections almost don't even exist without accurate or somewhat accurate projections. Because if you don't have somewhat accurate projections uh, available anywhere, how can you even predict what the field is, is going to do at least in some capacity, right? Or even if you didn't have DFS projections, right? You would have, you know, for a football slate, you'd have Vegas totals or something like that. And then you could potentially use that to project ownership, but you would still, that that's essentially a projection model at that point. Vegas game totals is, is a very uh, generic or, or basic projection model or something like that. So um, anyway, it, it's, it's kind of an interesting thought experiment, but I think you definitely need projections first. Um, and I would say that even having even having good ownership projections basically implies the existence of projections. So, um, but Patrick says PGA DFS doesn't need projections. We're just trying to pick players who will finish in the top 10. Ownership is key in PGA. I get what you were saying there, but I still, I think you kind of still need a sense of of projections, right? I mean, even so, even salaries are a projection model, right? Like when you get draft, DraftKings salaries is essentially the most rudimentary projection model there would be in in DFS, right? Th- you still need this to to play, right? Like you 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 need a sense that a player is a better a better player than the other, right? Then I, I would still want that first. Right, like you can say when you're saying ownership is key in golf, you're saying that hey, Tony Finau, Hideki, and Sungjae all probably have roughly a similar percent chance of winning the tournament, and you're getting Sungjae at an ownership discount, so he's a good play. You're not saying oh, uh, Tony Finau is thirty uh, percent owned, and 
Um, Harry Higgs is 1% owned. So Higgs is the better play purely based on ownership, right? So, and this is shady, I think summarizes the point I'm trying to make in a better way than I am, I'm doing. You can be profitable with only projections. You cannot be with only ownership, right? And I would agree with that. And I think that the big point here is really that like an average projection is, 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 is one thing, right? And an average part, part of like the Saberson sell on a lot of our, our content is that average projections alone actually aren't that useful, but you do need some way, something to, to basically compare one player to another and say that player's outcomes are better than the other, whether that's the DraftKings salary, an average projection, a Vegas total, something like that, right? Um, so I, I think you still, all of this I think is is mostly just, this is, this is mostly just like a thought experiment. I don't think there's a lot super practical here, um, but I think you need some sense of, of understanding a player projection before you you have ownership. Or if you could only have one, you would probably always want the projections first. So um, Francis says, uh, I could have missed this, but do you use research builds for PGA? I do. Uh, it is one of my preferred sports to use a research build for um, with some careful exceptions or, or not even exceptions, but things to, things to be careful about. Um, the main reason why I, the, the, well, the main reason why I, I like research builds uh, is that I think the assumptions of the research build fit golf pretty well. I think a 1500 simulation sample does a pretty decent job of approximating a, an accurate optimal rate for a particular golfer. And while you don't necessarily need the optimal lineup exactly to win a golf contest most weeks, I think the winning lineups, the top 1%, top 0.1% lineups in a contest, especially larger field contests that I like to play, do at least approach the optimal. So I think they do a pretty good job. Uh, the one thing I would be very careful of when you are running your golf research builds is the ownership projections, right? Uh, our ownership model is a very analytical approach and golf DFS is a very narrative driven and human game. So our ownership projections can miss ownership steam. If there's a player that's getting talked up a ton, it will miss narratives, right? There are so many narratives in golf. There's, um, you know, guy playing his home course narrative. There's guy that's, you know, made a handful of straight cuts narrative. There's, there's all kinds of different narratives that will increase the ownership projection for a particular golfer that our analytical ownership model will not pick up on. So I will, I would highly recommend researching the slate, particularly the ownership projections, and don't necessarily take them as straight fact. Um, because if you do, I think you could potentially, you could be put in a direction where you are, you know, fading a player or playing a player because of like, assuming that an ownership projection was perfectly accurate when it was not. Right. So um, I, that is the one thing, that is the one thing I would be careful of. Like, I, I think probably the best way to start your, golf DFS process with Saberson is a quick look over. I typically go by salary range by salary range is a quick look over uh, and see if there's any particular guys that I think are going to be, you know, over or under owned than what we are projecting. Um, so two names that jumped out when we just did that um, were Chris Goddard um, and Ju Young Kim, who are both um, young golfers that are like everywhere recently on on social media and the the kind of golf dfs world i see these names popping up all the time they're on a bunch of like lists of guys like hey play these guys this week anytime you see that right um i think that's a good sign that they're going to be higher on than average i think uh updating i think just doing a quick look over the ownership projections or even comparing to other ownership models and seeing if there's anything we're missing um i think is the best way to add value before running that that research build um and we do it is on our list to spend a little bit of time on the golf ownership model because I do think it would benefit from um, a little bit of a little bit of TLC there but in the meantime um, that would be the the number one thing I would look at but I do think it's a really good sport for for using a research build so cool all right I don't see any other questions coming in here let's jump back um, we were talking a little bit about building a computer here. 
Uh, Patrick said, uh, thank you for the suggestion on uh, logical increments. I spent two hours looking at stuff. How do you deal with warranty on parts? Um, I don't really know what you mean, actually, uh, about warranty on parts. Um, I think a lot of computer parts out there just have warranties for those kinds of things. Um, I typically don't buy extra warranties for that for that kind of stuff most of the time. Um, I have had issues with defective parts getting delivered before and most of the retailers that I've purchased from for these parts, you know, Newegg, um, Micro Center, uh, Amazon are all pretty flexible with like taking returns on defective parts. I've had a, the worst one ever is a defective motherboard, um, especially because in your troubleshooting process, if you have a bad motherboard, it's like the last thing that you could, you basically have to kind of test out everything else. Uh, and so it takes a long time to prove that you have a bad motherboard. And then once you figure that out, it requires basically a total disassembly uh, of the computer. Um, so that's always a bit of a painful one. But I, I've never, a lot of those parts have some some warranties built in when you buy them. I've never paid for an extra warranty on top of that, if that's, that's what you're referring to. So, um, but that's just me. So, and Patrick said, nobody's playing Harry Higgs. Yeah, but he's projected 1% owned, sub 1% owned. So um, that was just an example, right? But that was kind of the point I was making, right? Is like, so like you could, you could look at just projections and say, Tony Finau is a better play than uh, Doug Gim, right? Like the projections would imply that, right? And, and that's, if you were just trying to say, hey, which guy is going to perform better on average, that would just probably be true, assuming that you're using a, a decent projection model, whether that's an average DFS projection, whether that's a DraftKings salary or a, or a Vegas win odds, right? Ownership projections kind of can't be used in that way. You couldn't just look and say uh, a player that is going to be lower owned is a better play than a player that's going to be higher owned without a projection model to contextualize that statement. So that's why I think you have to have a projection model first. There's no way you could just just have just uh, just a, um, a, a an ownership and do anything meaningful with that. So, what about customer support? I don't know <laughs> what what about it. I don't know what this question means. I don't know. Shady said manufacturers are pretty good at the RMA process, even if the seller is shit. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a pretty good point as well. Um, I think actually now that I'm thinking about it, I think I worked, I did on the one defective motherboard I've ever purchased. Um, I think I worked through the, the actual, the manufacturer as opposed to the seller in that particular case. So, um, but anyway, we'll go ahead and leave it there for today. Um, this was, uh, this was a good stream. This was good. Um, I know we had a couple, uh, slower days here uh on stream the past couple days with the all-star break but we were right back at it with some some great questions here today um so i will be right back again tomorrow uh at uh 2 p.m eastern uh for the return of baseball for another office hours stream uh so uh, i will see everybody there tomorrow um and i guess in the meantime i always say i'm a little tripped up because i always say good luck at the end of this i guess uh good luck in your league of legends lineups uh good luck maybe in the very first half of round one of the 3m open um good luck in what other dfs contests are there tonight good luck in the rest of your your days good luck cooking cook, good luck cooking dinner um and uh i will i will see you guys all tomorrow take care